Welcome to Champions of Rural America, where the heartland meets Capitol Hill. I'm Christina Loren. The growing number of migrants seeking entry into the United States at the southern border has strained government resources and pushed our country's immigration system to a near breaking point. For everyday Americans, it's hard to grasp what's happening without seeing it firsthand. So we traveled to Arizona with congressional leaders of the Western Caucus to find out what rural Americans who live and work along the southern border are up against. First, a look from the rancher's perspective. The U.S.-Mexico border is over 1,900 miles long, but the fencing is sporadic. In some locations, it's tall, high, and sturdy. In other places, there's no fence at all. And you can see here where the fence just comes to an end. For our ranchers, they're dealing with a steady flow of illegal traffic on their properties because people are just coming through. I'm a fifth-generation Arizona rancher from Aravaca, Arizona. Since January, 2021, these cameras have recorded 3,050 images of unlawful border crossers. It's hard evidence. These filmed border crossers, as you can see, are wearing camouflage clothes, carpet shoes, and have almost identical pack backpacks. This is in stark contrast to other border crossers reported in the news along the international boundary in Arizona, California, and Texas, who wear casual street clothes and include women and or children. There are no images on my cameras for the last decade of any women with children. It is not lightly taken. It's outrageous, especially to have cartel scouts on our mountaintops. It's outrageous that we have foreigners watching us all the time, guiding their drug packers uh, through our ranch. We have gotten calls from the Border Patrol, don't go into your southern pastures. There are two factions of the Sinaloa cartel who are battling for control of the entrance routes through your place. So that means you don't go work your cattle. We love legal immigrants, but these drug packers coming through our ranch uh, are doing the nation harm. Uh, they're bad guys coming across our land. It's not immigrants. And it's horrible for one of my cowboys to be out gathering cattle and end up finding a body. People coming through our ranch need water. I have 24 wells and I put fountains on 29 different uh, water troughs. Um, so even druggers don't deserve to die in the desert, in my humble opinion. The hills have eyes around here. There are people watching you and for that reason, Many ranchers are not speaking up. You, sir, are brave. You are a bold couple to have this conversation with me on camera right now. We're fearful, uh, but we're tough. And uh, we're not going to stand down to the bully. We're going to either be on top of the ground in our family cemetery or below the ground, one or the other. They're not pushing us off. For these ranchers, this is their day-to-day -day life. This has become their reality. When a rancher used to go to check on his cows, he'd just go by himself. Uh, now he has to take somebody with him because if you get out to open a gate, you may not have a truck. They'll jump in your truck, you know, be hiding in the brush and, and steal your truck. Now there you are afoot with, with no truck. It's gotten pretty dangerous, you know friends that won't allow their kids to ride on their own ranch because they don't want them out there getting killed. And so, and, and that doesn't speak of the trash and the damage to the fences. Well, once they steal your truck, they don't really stay on the roads because they don't want to stay on the roads, so they just run it through the fence, tear the fence out. They don't really care. So now you've got cattle out on the highway. There's many ranchers I know that um, Nobody ever leaves a house. Somebody's always home. If they go to town or go run errands or go out, somebody always stays in the house. 
and then there's some along the very border itself that they never lock their house they just leave it open because if they're going to come bust in why tear it up you know so a lot of them leave food out and everything just so they don't get broke into you know it's changed the cartels control the border they control a good chunk of southern arizona so that's really sad you know they they make these poor people they just trying to come up here to, to have a better life but they make drug mules out of them carry a 50 pound pack you know if, if they get chased do they abandon them out there in the desert no water uh, we found many many of them just dead of exposure last year alone we apprehended almost two and a half million people illegally entering our country of last year's groups over 35,000 had prior criminal convictions or outstanding warrants for arrests in the United States approximately 170 of them were on the terrorist watch list uh, a terrorist on the watch list got through uh, the border of California, ended up in Minnesota, was there for almost a year before uh, we realized that he was on the terror watch list and uh, took him into custody. But in that eight or nine months, it's alleged he was involved in arms sales. And then when you talk about the 1.7 million gotaways, 1.7 million gotaways. I want to remind the people that it took 19 terrorists, 9-11. They need more agents and they need more technology at our border. The sheriffs uh, who respond and help the Border Patrol agents can, can handle three or four coming over a wall, but not three or 400 just going around the wall. We saw that. I immigrated to the country when I was 11 and uh, my, it took my family quite a while to become U.S. citizens, all the way up to 2006. And then 16 years later after that, I get elected to the United States Congress. So I truly believe in the opportunities this country offers and, and, and people coming here pursuing the American dream. What we're seeing on the border right now is not what the American dream looks like, though people are suffering on the border, the human trafficking, the humanitarian crisis, not to mention the abuses on, on the people that are being trafficked. It's, it's horrific. First of all, it is worse than I thought. Right, it just is, we hear all these terrible things back in Utah and back in Washington, and what I'm actually seeing is that this is not just an immigration issue, this is an organized crime issue. Utahns, of all people, are very concerned about the humanitarian side of this, but if you come here and see, we are doing the worst possible thing for the humanity of these people. It's a, it's a false promise that they can come here, risk their lives, have all these terrible conditions, become almost slaves to the coyotes that bring them in. That's not good for, for humanity. And, and you can imagine what, what's happening to these private property owners. And it's not fair to them, and it's not fair to those crossing, and it's not fair to those that live here. One of the sad things about it is our land values. Once those, you know, highly sought after South Texas ranches, you know, great deer hunting property, great cattle country, uh, a lot of it great sheep and goat country, uh, ranching country, you know, the value is just plummeted. I mean, you can't get anybody to buy it at any price. So, I mean, no one wants to have to deal with the cartels and all the influx of the illegal immigrants, you know, crossing the land, cutting the fences, destroying infrastructure. So it's really uh, been detrimental on, on the land prices. The Center for Biological Diversity has sued over overuse of our pastures by cattle. Well, they simultaneously opposed completion of the wall. And the pictures they took of the cattle in the riparian areas were Mexican cattle. So not only do we have the persons from Mexico, we have the cattle from Mexico. We fight hard to keep our animals healthy and safe for our good food supply chain, but there are foreign animal diseases that we fight against every day. And, uh, um, you know, FMD, hoof and mouth disease, is the first one that hits me, you know. And, you know, coming across the border, you don't know what they're carrying. There are places where they can actually walk across to e either side, especially if the fences have been cut. So we have the fever tick. And if, if you'll remember, the fever tick is what shut down the Longhorn cattle drives and caused barbed wire fences to put up because as these cattle from Mexico and South Texas went north, they took the fever tick with them. That's one. But there's other diseases like tuberculosis, uh, brucellosis, uh, that we've pretty much eradicated in the United States, but if we have cattle coming across, then we get reinfected. Coming up on Champions of Rural America, we take a look at the heavy environmental strain that rural Americans living along the U.S. border with Mexico are trying to keep up with.
Welcome back to Champions of Rural America. I'm Christina Loren. The sheer volume of people crossing our southern border has exponentially driven up the amount of pollution that is piling up on our public lands and private property. With more than 2.4 million illegal crossings last year, it's likely that illegal immigrants left a minimum of 14.4 million pounds of trash. Let me say that again. Illegal immigration is causing millions of pounds of trash to pile up on our federal lands. National Park Service employee at the Coronado reported that the trash piles there have grown so large that they have become resting spots for illegal immigrants who then need to be airlifted out of this ecologically sensitive area at enormous expense to the taxpayer. You cannot call yourself a true conservationist unless you are willing to take a hard look at the environmental toll illegal immigration is having on our public lands. On average, every illegal that comes across that border is dropping between six and eight pounds of trash. With 10 million illegals coming across that border, that's 80 million pounds of trash that is being dumped in our waterways, in our rivers. They're destroying our stream beds. They are destroying our farm ground. They're destroying our BLM lands. They are destroying sensitive sites. Uh, first of all, you will see a pile of firewood. This is firewood that has been harvested in the Coronado National Forest. And here we have the firewood being burned. This is just happening in our national forest, not far from here. Slide three, you'll see the trash and food piles, all stacked up in the national forest. I want to give a few metrics on something that I think is very important for what we're discussing today, and that's specifically the environmental impact of the illegal crossing. For a NEPA environmental review process, it takes approximately 6.1 years. To obtain a 404 permit under the Clean Water Act, it takes 10 or more years and costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Over $1.7 billion is spent each year by the private and public sectors obtaining wetlands permits. The irony is, is that none of the individuals or companies undertaking a NEPA analysis or a 404 permit would ever be allowed to cause the type of environmental degradation and destruction that the cartels and illegals are causing throughout our southern border, as shown in the photographs that we saw today. People seeking to enter our country without passing through a legal port of entry are breaking federal law. The damage these people do to the public and private lands while entering unlawfully is unacceptable, and the refuse they leave behind is remarkable. Where I live in Yuma County, my neighbors and I grow fresh produce such as lettuce, spinach, melons, broccoli, and cauliflower in season. The food that we're growing is mostly eaten raw by people all over the United States and Canada. We have individuals and families numbering in the thousands entering our country through areas that are not ports of entry on a daily basis. We face unique challenges having food crops of the kind that are normally eaten raw growing in open fields. We can't have trespassers entering those fields, passing through these fields, leaving garbage in these fields, or even worse, defecating or urinating in or near these fields. Is it too much to ask that farmers of Southern Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas be able to raise their crops without being overrun by illegal immigrants and drug runners? I don't think it is. Everything he's going through with the illegal migrants coming across his property, how on earth would somebody want to come along behind him and say, yeah, that's the career I want? And what does that mean for the American people when we have to have food? We have to have the things that are produced in rural America when rural America is being overrun with this crisis. We had a unique situation where a whole group of Haitian immigrants camped out alongside one of our fresh produce fields, one of my neighbors, and stayed there for a couple of days. They were unique in that they weren't walking across the border and saying, here I am, where's my free bus ticket, my free meal ticket, uh, my free airline ticket in my hotel room. Um, they were less trusting of um, federal and local authorities, so they camped out for a couple of days, mostly women and children. Um, you don't want people sitting next to your fresh produce field who you can't get to leave. The worst part about it is most of the folks that I mentioned in my testimony um, that work, uh, legally work in agricultural fields in my community, um, the first and second generation immigrants, uh, ask them what they think about what's going on today. It, they are appalled. These are people that spent tens of thousands of their own hard earned dollars. Sometimes it impacted multiple generations. Many of them are the ones out here picking up the trash, refuse, and trying to make use of the crops uh, behind uh, this tragedy. 
the, the unusual thing is that in our community, we are short of workers every day to do work in our fields. Right. Um, and a good friend of mine rec recently approached Border Patrol about visiting some of the folks who are seeking asylum and who have entered our country uh, uh, without documentation that are being held temporarily. Uh, he approached them about uh, asking them if they wanted to do, uh, join the H-2A program. He uh, addressed over 900 uh, folks that had entered our country illegally awaiting uh, transportation or, or uh, appointments with courts. And uh, he received zero takers on his opportunity they're, to go to work. They're not here for jobs. They're not here for opportunity. At, at least not in the areas where they're crossing, for sure. Welcome back to Champions of Rural America. I'm Christina Loren. A public health crisis is also unfolding along the U.S.-Mexico border as migration and public health are inextricably linked. It was the economist Buckley that said you can either have an open border or you can have a welfare state, but you can't have both. And that's what we're seeing. You're seeing it in New York, you're seeing it in Chicago, you're seeing it in LA, you're seeing it in Denver. The hospital systems are collapsing. They're closing schools so that they can put illegal immigrants into the schools so that they can sleep there. When I was in the Yuma sector last February, they had $28 million in uncompensated care that the federal government was unwilling to reimburse. And that uncompensated care was for illegal aliens. The women in, in Yuma cannot have their babies in their hospital. They have to go to feeding because there's no room in the end. When an individual comes into one of our emergency facilities in need, the humanitarian thing to do, the altruistic thing to do, indeed the legal thing to do under our Intala laws is to provide that care. And there is no question that a number of these individuals, indeed almost all of them, at some point uh, in their lives are going to need access to our health care system. Now, whether it's for years and years of untreated chronic illnesses, such as diabetes and asthma and heart disease, or whether it's for acute problems, our emergency rooms are going to have to deal with the complexities of these individuals. And in many instances, we're also dealing with the additional complexity of language challenges, cultural challenges, inability to obtain a full and complete medical history, which we've been able to do for most of our patients across the country. How that will be transitioned into long-term care, preventive care, uh, is what really will have to be determined in the future. You can have a welfare state where we can address our homegrown homeless population and mentally ill, or you can be bringing in millions of people who are going to need services. And we're now taking the services and the, and the funds and the, and the resources that we have away from American citizens and giving it to people who are here illegally. You have to look at this as, as, as an immediate crisis, a midterm crisis, and a long-term crisis. And unless we get a hold of it today, it's going to be worse two years down the road and worse 10 years down the road. That's why every single day that goes by exacerbates this problem beyond even almost being able to solve it because of the numbers that are coming through. What is ultimately going to happen with Social Security? What happens with Medicare? What happens with Medicaid? Eventually they collapse. And then the contract between the federal government and the citizens of this country is breached because there isn't going to be the resources to pay it. What's happening is we've got all these people being encouraged to come here with a false promise of the American dream, and we're, we're, we're not being honest with them, and we need to be honest with them. We need to put policies into a place to make sure people obey our laws and that we have opportunities for the right people to come into this country under the right circumstances. And there's just so many things wrong with this, and another issue that you and I haven't even talked about is the fentanyl that's making it its way up into Utah, killing our kids. When I look at public safety, national security, and the humanitarian on our southern border, it has become the largest crime scene in this country. My deputies and law enforcement continue to be placed in life-threatening scenarios as the cartels show no regard for citizens and those that wear a badge. Arizona fentanyl seizures account for 51% of all the fentanyl seized in the country. In federal fiscal year 2022, Arizona seized over 60 million fentanyl pills. The reason fentanyl, uh, a synthetic opioid, has become so significant in that it is 100 times more potent than morphine. By profession, I'm a pharmacist, and I will tell you that the fentanyl problem it, 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 the crisis that we have in the country, killing 200 people every day, the number one killer, as the chairman told you, of, of adults, 18 to 45, 
I was embarrassed. I made a mistake. I, I was in a town hall meeting, and I, I referred to it as fentanyl addiction. And a mother stood up and corrected me as she should have, and she said, no, sir, it's not fentanyl addiction. She said, my son took one pill, and he's dead. It's fentanyl poisoning. It's poisoning our citizens. This is about the sovereignty of our country. This is about American control of American soil. And when I hear a local sheriff and I hear a border patrol agent uh, tell a committee of Congress that the Mexican cartels are the ones that are controlling not only the southern side of the border, but our side of the border, that puts a fire in my gut. When I'm back in my district, and I'm meeting with uh, counties that are 15,000 people, and they're losing a person a month to fentanyl. This is the number one issue in this country, and we need to resolve it now. You know, especially when you have lawlessness, and that's what this is. And, and if they're gonna cross the border any way they can, so they'd have no respect for our laws. They have no respect for our law enforcement. So you, at, at some point, you're gonna lose your country. We've got to get our country back. Well, certainly, if we ever give up on our border, then we give up on America, because uh, clearly this part of the, of the border is where really bad people come through. They're coming through the mountains that are in camouflage. They're seeing people coming with guns. You know, America needs to see what's happening here in Arizona. They need to hear about it. But more importantly, we need to work together to find solutions. There's nothing more important as a member of Congress, as a, as a person that's in the federal government, to secure the future of this country for everybody that's currently living here, and for all of our future generations. We don't, we don't politicize getting on an airplane, making sure everybody's safe and secure there, or on a port of entry for an ocean liner, but somehow the southern border, we politicize that. Each month, we like to put the spotlight on one of the members of the Western Caucus to find out more about what drives their passion to serve rural America in Washington, D.C. This month, it's Western Caucus Chair, U.S. Representative, Dan Newhouse. So I come from a small town in central Washington. It's called Sunnyside. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, and we raise a lot of different crops in Washington State. Myself, on our farm, we raise hops. That's our main crop, which is important for the production of beer. Um, we also raise wine grapes. And then we've got some tree fruit as well, cherries and pears. I didn't feel that uh, Congress had enough voices from the agricultural industry when we still have few uh, only I think less than two dozen out of 535 people have our farmers or ranchers and so our voices have to be loud uh, when we represent our constituents and so it, it's an honor to, to represent such a great state rural rural people that um, really are concerned about the future of our country We've got a lot of important issues facing our country, and, and that's what keeps me motivated. I, I think are at risk if we don't make the right choices into the future. So, uh, so many critical things that we need a voice from rural America. I think it's so important that the things that we hold dear to us, we emulate in our government, that we treat the entire population as we would want to be treated individually. Thank you for joining us for Champions of Rural America. Wishing you and your family a beautifully blessed evening.